Hello, I'm Jamie Ellis from the University of Florida's Honeybee Research and Extension Lab, and welcome to a video field guide to beekeeping. Today we'll be discussing Nosema disease, a disease that cuts right to the bowels of the bee. Nozema is a worldwide bee disease. In fact, it's considered one of the deadliest pathogens that affect bees globally. Nozema is actually a single-celled organism that lives in the guts of the bee. It is actually a microsporidae which belongs to a fungi group. It's a fungus that actually affects bees as they ingest it. So Nozema can be spread from bee to bee as bees feed one another via trophallaxis or as bees clean fecal material deposited by infected bees. Nozema has two species that affect bees. The first species is Nozema, the genus, Apis, the species. Nozema Apis has been in the United States for a very long time. And typically, beekeepers believe that when they see Nozema-like symptoms, that it's Nozema Apis that causes the problem. But in fact, Nozema serrana, a second species of Nozema, has been found in the U.S in recent years. It's very difficult to distinguish between these two nosema, but both likely cause very similar symptoms in bee colonies. Now that we've discussed the biology of nosema, let's talk about some of the symptoms associated with the disease and how to diagnose it accurately. First, the symptoms. You must remember that nosema is a gut disease. And typically, diseases such as this build up to significant levels when there's a large population confined to a single area. The time of year that that most occurs for honeybees is fall and winter. Consequently, nosema tends to be a worse problem in late winter, simply because the bees have been trapped in the box all winter, they've been able to come out and defecate, so the diseases build up to levels that are not tolerable for the bees anymore. So how does this manifest according to their symptoms. Now, it's quite simple. There are really three symptoms associated with nosema disease. First, you'll see bees wandering on the ground outside of the colony. Now, this symptom also occurs with a number of other bee diseases, so it's not a true indicator of nosema, but it is certainly something that happens to the bees once they have a nosema buildup. Secondly, bees with high nosema spore counts in their body will exhibit what we call K-wing. Now, K-wing is where the forewing and the hindwing of the bee come unhooked and they're displayed like the letter K of a bee. Now again, although this symptom is associated with nosema, it's not unique to nosema. Tracheal mites, for example, can cause K-wing in bees. So bees on the ground, K-wing, both come with nosema, but they're not unique to nosema. The third symptom tends to show up more in nosema colonies almost exclusively, and it is fecal staining on the front of the colony. Now, if you remember, nosema is building up in the bee's system during winter as bees are unable to come out and void their feces. So what happens is on the first warm day, usually associated with early spring or late winter, the bees will leave the colony to defecate, and the moment they come outside, they'll defecate, which will result in fecal stains or streaks up and down the front of the colony. And this is typically uh, yellowish or brown or slight orangish color. Finally, another nosema symptom has to do with a slow spring buildup. When the spring is coming on, it's warm outside, the bees are simply not able to grow to the levels that they need to be. Despite these symptoms, it's not 100% accurate to say that you have nosema even if you have all these symptoms. The only way to truly diagnose nosema is to collect a sample of bees put them in isopropyl or rubbing alcohol and send them to your county agent or your state apiculturist who will do dissections to determine if you have spores present in your bees. When you're collecting bees to send, it's important to get bees that are older because these are the ones that are most likely to have large spore counts. 
So I recommend collecting bees from the ground in front of the colony or collecting bees from the frames on the periphery of the nest where older bees typically hang out. Do these things, send it to your local county agent, and we'll teach you next how to diagnose the problem. Dissecting your bees for nosema is actually something that you can do. And whether you elect to do it yourself or you send it to your state apiculturist, we'll be doing the same thing when we dissect our bees. So let me go over with you the tools that you'll need and the procedure that you follow to dissect your bees to determine if you have nosema present in your colonies. First of all, it's important to have a compound microscope. Now this microscope can go up to 400 magnification power and you'll need that because nosema spores are actually quite small. Because they're in the gut of the bee, you're going to have to macerate the bee and in order to do that, you're going to have to have a mortar and pestle. This permits you to remove the abdomen from the bee, grind up the abdomen, and have a slurry through which you can try to find the nosema spores. It's also useful to have forceps. I prefer to use two pairs of forceps because that way you can grasp the bee with one pair and then use the second bear, pair to remove the bee's abdomen. You'll also need a micro pipette. Now this one here is electronic. You won't need an electronic one, but this particular one is very useful for us. It needs to be able to measure milliliters or apply milliliters of fluid. It's also very useful to have an eyedropper because we're going to be using this to apply the spore slurry to our slide. You'll need a container of water because you'll be macerating the bee abdomens in water. Finally, you'll need a hemocytometer. Now, a hemocytometer is a special slide that they typically use to count blood cells. If you look through the microscope at this plate here, you'll actually see that there's a grid marked on this hemocytometer. That permits you to count spores per unit area, and using a formula, you can actually estimate the number of spores per bee. Now that you have everything that you need to do your dissections, let's walk through the process of actually doing one. If you remember, we collected bees from the field, from in front of your colonies, or older bees from the inner cover of your colonies, or on the frames on the edges of your boxes. Now that you have that, you'll need to remove the abdomen from 25 bees using your forceps and put them straight into your mortar and pester. So with the first bee, you'll grab with your forceps, and you'll simply remove the abdomen and place it into your mortar and pestle. After you've done this for 25 bees, you'll need to add about three to four milliliters of water to your mortar and pestle. You'll do that to provide a liquid medium into which you can mix up your bee abdomens very easily. Once you have about three to four milliliters of water in there with your 25 bee abdomens, you need to grind the bee abdomen sufficiently to break up the midgut and hindgut where the nosema spores are. So as you grind them up, remember that you need to mix it up really well because you want to evenly distribute those nosema spores to give you a more accurate count. Once you've done that, you need to add water up to the number of milliliters per bee that you put into your mortar and pestle. For example, we put 25 bees into our mortar and pestle we added already four milliliters of water to macerate it, but we need a total of 25 milliliters of water because we do one mil per abdomen. So we're going to add another 21 milliliters of water to this slurry and mix it further. Once you've thoroughly mixed the abdomens in the mortar and pestle, you're going to take a small drop using your eyedropper and put it on your hemocytometer. After you do this, you're going to replace the cover slip of the hemocytometer. And the cover slip makes it where if you put too much water, it'll push some of it out of the way. Or if you put too little, you'll see that the top is not covered. And all you have to do in that instance is add more water. After you've done this, you put it under your microscope. And you count the number of spores that you see in your hemocytometer. Now, if you look closely in your hemocytometer, you're going to notice that there are 25 large squares. Each large square is going to be further subdivided into 16 smaller squares. If you count the number of nosema spores in five of the large squares, 
the one in the upper left, the upper right, the lower left, and the lower right corners of the slide, as well as the single square, the large square in the very middle of the slide. Count those number of spores, multiply that by 50,000, and you'll get the average number of spores you have per bee. So what does a Nosema spore look like? Well, Nosema spores are shaped roughly like eggs or ovals. A lot of people refer to them as racetrack shaped. If you actually look at a spore, it's smaller in the middle or pinched in the middle compared to the outer ring, which tends to be thicker. They're very characteristic spores, so they're hard to miss. Having just left the lab and discussing how to accurately diagnose nosema levels in your bees, let's talk very briefly about thresholds. Now remember, the point of a video field guide to beekeeping is for us to give you some tools that you can use to reduce your pest populations below the economic threshold, the level above which your colony suffers, but below which life is okay. Now with nosema, that happens to be particularly difficult largely because researchers don't agree on what is the threshold for nosema disease. Some people suggest as many as one million spores per bee warrants a treatment. Some people suggest that that number is as low as 10,000 spores per bee. So what you have is this huge range and this great disparity between levels of nosema that actually cause a problem. Take for example the 10,000 spore per bee count. If there's that many nosema spores in your bees, your bees are very much in danger of reaching the threshold very quickly, simply because those spores can reproduce very rapidly and you'll have lots of spores before you know it. So probably the best recommendation to make is if you find spores, nosema spores, in your field of view when you're doing diagnosis for nosema presence, if you find spores two to five or more in your field of view, then I recommend a treatment. Unfortunately, nosema is very difficult to control using integrated pest management, largely because there are no cultural or mechanical tools that we can use that actually help control nosema disease. Nosema is controlled exclusively using a product called fumagillin. Fumagillin has to be mixed with sugar water and fed to bees. I want to stress that you must follow label indications or directions when you're using fumagillin. The other difficulty about fumagillin is there's some research out there that suggests that nosema apis responds a little bit differently to the fumagillin than does nosema serrana. In fact, you may need to treat your colonies more with fumagillin if, you're use, if you have nosema serrana. And to be honest, it's really difficult to distinguish between the two. So recommendations are currently coming out on how to control nosema apis versus serrana or whether or not to simply treat them as nosema and treat them both as the same. Most important to know though is if you elect to use fumagillin, there are some indications that your colonies actually need a treatment. We've already discussed one with regard to spore count. When you reach a certain spore level in your bees, then you need to treat. A second indication is you could treat prophylactically. That simply means you treat before you have the problem. And since fumagillin is very useful against nosema, and since nosema happens to be a big problem in late winter, if you treat your bees in fall, late fall, you're preparing those bees that go into the winter cluster to be ready for the nosema that's on its way. So you treat late fall, your bees should come out of winter feeling pretty good and being pretty healthy. The last thing I want to tell you about nosema control is nosema tends to be a worse problem in northern climates, typically because the bees have to be in colonies longer and they spread the pathogen a little bit easier. In the southern states, nosema probably is not such a significant issue, but researchers currently are looking into that right now. So my typical recommendation is if you live in northern states to treat prophylactically in late fall, if you live in southern states to treat only if there's an indication that your bees are highly infested with nosema. Hopefully you've learned a little bit about nosema disease today. As you can tell, it's very difficult to deal with largely because we don't really know today how the nosemas respond to the treatments. Its biology is becoming better understood with the, with the introduction of nosema serrana and all of the stuff associated with the new research out there right now. But it's my hope that you leave this episode with a greater understanding of nosema, recognize it as a problem, and now know a little bit about its control. I hope you enjoyed this episode of a video field guide to beekeeping.